Hello everyone and welcome to the Everton Show. The Premier League table looks well, doesn't it? The Toffees are sitting pretty in third place with three wins and a draw from our opening four Premier League games and just two goals conceded along the way. So plenty of positives to reflect on this week in the company of Graeme Stewart. What a great start. Really good start from the lads and uh, to the point where I'm going to have to pull you up, Daz. I want joint second, not third. <laughs> um, they deserve that. It's been a... It's, you know, people will look at the fixture list and say we've had a, a, a comfortable start. But Tottenham at home was always going to be difficult. It was a decent point. I think we'll look back at that and say that it's a decent point. And then wins at Stoke and, and what have you, West Brom. And then the, the, the victory at Sunderland as well really puts us in good shape. Whether we're second or whether we're third, whether we're going with alphabetical order or not, <laughs> yeah. it still looks great. And it's never too early to be up there, is it? Of course not. I mean, you know, you, you gain confidence from winning games of football and seeing the points on the board. You know, even now, people are looking up at us, seeing us, you know, second, third, whichever way you want to call it. But we've got 10 points on the board and that's good. That's really good progress with a great opportunity with another couple of mouth altering Premier League fixtures to come up and, and possibly get another maximum amount of points out of them. Confidence is so important, isn't it? It really is. Leicester showed that last season. Mm, absolutely. Here's a quick preview of what's in store on this week's Everton show. You know strikers, if they don't score, they doubt, they doubt and, and they need the goal. And it's perfect that he scored uh, the hat-trick tonight. Like I said, I needed one more week and, uh, and I'm happy that uh, I got the goals flowing as well. So now just back in business and I want to help my teammates as much as I can to uh, achieve our, uh, our objectives. Sí, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. I'm very happy to be here. It's a great club uh, with uh, excellent fans. Um, I'm made up since I saw my first one. It's, uh, it's what I wanted. You know, it's the club that I want to be at and want to play for. And uh, hopefully I can get many more. It's not just that game, I think it was many a game you know, that you're going into. I remember going into one game and I think in the first six minutes I think we're playing against Notts County and John Chidozzi scores. And uh, you know, you just look around and you say, how's that happened? And you, but you just know that you're going to win it. Um, it's just by how many. Ronald Koeman will tell us very shortly, Graeme, he wasn't overly impressed with the first half, but he showed time and again he's not afraid to change things if things aren't going well. It's the mark of a good manager. It's the mark of a man who knows what he wants and what he expects. Uh, he did it at West Brom when it was you know, clear to a glass eye that things weren't yeah. going as we'd like them to. And he made the change instantly. He put Romelu Lukaku on that afternoon and you know, that, that, that influence of Rom Romelu coming on and just that aerial threat and a little bit more power up top transformed the game for us. Equally against Sunderland, we weren't very good in possession of the ball or not to the level that we expect in the first half. He made a change, a decisive change, and we were so much better in the second half. I suppose the players will like that, won't they? They'll know exactly where they stand. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're not contributing and the manager doesn't think that his system is going to win the football match, he'll make a change. Of course, and that's what you've got to have throughout the side. That's what Ronald Koeman and the coaching staff want at this football club. You want competition in every single place. We want to keep everybody on their toes so that you know that you dip, you know, you dip under the level that you're expected to play at you could be coming off. Unfortunately, it happened to Ross. You know, Ross is, you know, Ross is a young man and he's going to have difficulties somewhere along the line in his, in his career. He's got a challenge now. He's got to prove the manager wrong. He's got, to, he's got to raise his game. But that's part and parcel of being a footballer. You always get the odd test. Second half tempo was terrific, wasn't it? They couldn't live with us. No, they couldn't. As soon as we got that first goal, you know, they, they capitulated it, it must be said. But that's down to the fact that we pr press better our passing was more decisive and incisive. You know, the goals that we scored, you know, we hit them hard. You know, a, a hat-trick for Romelu in 11, 11 minutes is really, really top draw stuff and tough to come back from. And he hit the bar as well, didn't he, on that 11 minutes? Unbelievable. Well, Monday night's demolition of Sunderland was a fourth consecutive win for Everton in all competitions. The impact of Ronald Koeman is crystal clear. The stats speak for themselves. But the boss wasn't happy with what he'd seen in the first half at the Stadium of Light and didn't he let the players know about it at half-time, even if he couldn't repeat his exact words to the Everton show. <laughs> I can't say that <laughs> for the camera. But I was really uh, disappointed uh, after 45 minutes because from the start in the game we lost so many balls, easy balls in, in our ball position. And then you make the opponent stronger than, than they normally are. And uh, I was really disappointed about the first uh, 45 minutes. Gerard De La Feo came on. He just gave us a little spark, a little bit something different, didn't he? Yeah. But it's always difficult because you, you change some, somebody 
like Ross, uh, that's difficult because normally it's a good player, but uh, he did not play well. He lost a lot of balls in the first 45 minutes and, and, and I was thinking about to give everybody a reaction uh, and to change something. We had to change something and, and okay, then you need to wait if it's a good uh, substitute, is, is the change, uh, it's okay. And, and the boys showed really the level what we can be and that was the level of the second half, but not uh, the level about the first half. Within the space of 11 minutes, Romelu Lukaku scored two headers, one shot and hit the bar. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, we, at that time, we had uh, pace and, and uh, we had good crosses. And then, you know, he had already in the first half uh, a big chance, a big header. Uh, also a great cross from uh, Yannick. Mm. And, and the, the, the two crosses in the second half were perfect. And, and, and then, you know, he's dangerous and then he will score. If he get that kind of uh, opportunities for from his teammates, then he will score the goal. And, and that was great because, uh, you know, strikers, if they don't score and they mm. doubt, they doubt and, and they need the goal. And it's perfect that he scored uh, the hat-trick tonight. The manager is very honest with his appraisals, isn't he? He is. Again, that's refreshing for supporters, mm -hmm. for players. Everybody knows where they stand. You know, I, I like to hear it. Sometimes as a player, you don't like to hear it because it's, it's critical of you. But the reality of it is it's, it, it's the truth. And you sit back and in the cold light of day, you know, Rom, Rom, and, you know Rom, Romelu Lukaku will be ecstatic about mm -hmm. his three goals. There's no doubt about that. And Ross will be disappointed that he wasn't part of that second half. But, you know, these things are all in the mix. We're all in it together. And it was just unfortunate that for Ross that he, he did come off. He'll sit down with the manager and the mm. manager will explain his decision, explain what he wants from him, and he'll be a better player for it to come. He'll bounce back, Graham, won't he? Of course he will. He's too good a player to not bounce back, but he's got to take on board the criticism. Mm. He's got to shrug it to one side to a degree as well and concentrate on making himself better. Don't get too down about it mm -hmm. because we've all been there. We've all had to accept difficult situations. But, if you know, it's a test of his character and I'm sure he's got plenty of it. Since Ashley Williams came into the side, we haven't conceded a single goal. It can't be coincidence. No, I think the, the partnership there of, of, of Ashley and, and Jags has been outstanding. They're both very, very experienced players. They both know their jobs. There's no airs and graces about the pair of them. And they obviously talk to each other well and communicate, which is important. And... You know, it really does look like a formidable partnership and Seamus Coleman, credit to him as well, came mm. in for his first start of the season and played exceptionally well. Really, really strong at the back. Well, Romelu Lukaku's third goal on Monday night was his 64th for Everton in just 131 games. That's just short of a goal every other game, which is a great record for a 23-year-old striker. And here's another one. Only Duncan Ferguson and Tim Cahill have scored more Premier League goals for Everton than Romelu Lukaku. He's certainly back in the groove in front of goal and he was all smiles after the game up at Sunderland. Yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm delighted, but uh, I'm more delighted with the win. Um, to be fair, the, the first half was not the best, but then the second half we showed the quality. And uh, we have to pr improve on it. Uh, I think uh, we, we have to expect a lot from ourselves. You know, we, 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 we let ourselves down in the last couple of seasons. And, um, you know, now it's a, it's a, it's a new era. And, uh, you know, everybody has to fight and prove himself every day. And, um, you know, I think uh, it's good for the club. You're enjoying playing alongside Yannick Balassi, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was asking for him for four years now. So <laughs> <laughs> now he's here, so uh, he's up and running as well, like for his assist because he likes to give him assist. And uh, you know, I was there at the right place at the right time, but uh, his cross was amazing. Jordan Pickford made the save of the game from a header from you. You also hit the crossbar. You could have had a couple of hat tricks, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I'm back. Uh, I'm back in business now. I think uh, physically, I'm. Uh, like I said, I needed one more week and uh, you know, I'm happy that uh, I got the goals flowing as well. So now she's back in business and I want to help my teammates as much as I can to uh, achieve our, uh, our objectives. It's only early in the season, Ron, but to be second and third in the table is still nice, isn't it? It's nice, it's nice. But uh, like I said, you know, we, we witnessed something special last year. And for me, it's something that motivates me every day. You know, I've seen a, a team doing it last year. And, uh, you know, I just want to win. I just want to win every single game. And I go on the, mentali I go on the pitch with the mentality to kill every opponent that uh, is uh, ahead of me. And, uh, you know, I just I want to help my teammates win every game. And we have to watch game by game how far, what we can achieve. And, uh, you know, we won today and Saturday we have a home game. And uh, hopefully we're going to do the same again. Talk about perfect timing, Graham. Big Rom on the front cover of the magazine that's out this weekend. 
That's yeah. what it's all about. Written and in stars for him, wasn't it? He's back in the groove, isn't he? He is back in the groove. I mean, strikers are all the same, aren't they? Once they just get going, once that ball hits the onion bag the first time, they, that, you know, they're full of confidence again. They've got that extra yard, that spring in their step. And you could visibly see that in Romelu on Monday night. And, you know, an 11-minute hat-trick, two terrific headers, mm. and a really clinical finish as well for the third one to wrap his hat-trick up. Really, really good to see. He was never going to miss that third goal, was he? Once he was one-on-one, -on -one, because he'd already got to... Me, you, Snods, all said, here we go, hat-trick. Well, it's the biggest compliment you can pay, Big Rom, is the fact that when he goes through one-on-one -on -one in goal, you're expecting the net to mm. bulge, and, and he does that more often than not. I mean, the two fantastic crosses for his first two goals, one mm. from Adrisha, one from Yannick, they were outstanding deliveries. But that third goal, terrific through ball from Kevin Morales, perfect weight, big man does the rest. Plenty more goals to come from Romelu Lukaku, that's for sure. That brings us to the end of part one, but don't go too far away because after this short break, we'll be back to hear from Liam Walsh, David Unsworth and our latest addition to the first team squad, Enna Valencia. Welcome back to part two. Well, Monday night's game at Sunderland came just too soon for Enna Valencia. Our new loan signing from West Ham had travelled halfway around the world during the international break and scarcely had time to say hello to his new teammates before they boarded the coach up to the northeast. However, on Tuesday morning, he did find time in his schedule to make his Everton show debut. I'm very happy to be here. It's a great club um, with uh, excellent fans, and I, I want to be at the pitch with my with my new uh, teammates. I enjoy these these trainings with my teammates. Uh, it's, it's different with my last team. Uh, it's a little bit more hard. Uh, it's a great coach and management that I'm trying to to learn about them. Was that one of the reasons for wanting to sign for Everton, one of the attractions that you see so many excellent players, so many world-class players here and, and you want to be a part of that? I had uh, some options before, but when I heard about Everton and see it, the, uh, the quality of the players, uh, nobody will say that not to come here. It's a great opportunity for everybody to be here with great uh, teammates. And for me, it's an excellent opportunity to, to have a great year in the Premier League. On transfer deadline day, you were back in, in South America, in, in Ecuador. How and when did you find out about the chance to join Everton? And when I get the news, it was the last day of the transfer market. And I was very, very happy with that news because I was talking, my manager was talking with other teams. But for me, the best option was Everton. Yeah, a big smile on your face when it was announced one hour before the deadline. When the people that work with, work with me, uh, they told me about the news uh, that there is a possibility, an option of Everton in the morning, was a great news for me. But one hour before uh, that was confirmed, was the best the best news for me in that in that moment. What do you see as your strongest position? What, through the middle, out wide. Uh, my best performance in my career is, is like a striker in the, like a striker. Uh, the last year in West Ham, I used to play in like a, a winger, and it was difficult for me because it's not the, the position that, that I feel so well. But I tried uh, to to do my best. That could not have been easy for the boy, Graham. He's in Ecuador, and all the negotiations and the paperwork's going on over here in the UK. He was. As much in the dark as us, I suppose. Yeah, pretty much so. But, uh, I mean, obviously his agent and the people around him would have informed him of the interest of the football club and what have you. And he just has to basically sit tight and, you know, hope that the green light gets <laughs> uh, pressed. But, uh, no, it's difficult for him because he obviously wanted to come to us and he just mm. wanted to make sure that paperwork was all cleared and, and what have you. But uh, welcome to the club. His versatility in the attacking zone could be really useful. Well, I think that's the idea behind it. I mean, Ronald's got him in because he wants competition for places all around that, that front line. Um, he's got the one thing that defenders hate, and that's electric pace. Mm. You know, we've seen at his time when he was at West Ham that he can cause problems. He can come off the left-hand side, the right-hand side. He can play up front. You know, he could even play as a, as a two up front. I mean, it's just options everywhere across that front line that Ronald now has with the players that we've got. And the fact that he's 
New to Everton Football Club, but not new to the Premier League is another plus because he did ever so well at West Ham, who had a good season themselves last time out. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think that's important for us as well. We're not, we're not talking about somebody who's coming halfway across the world to, to take part in the Premier League and, and, and be a little bit wet behind the ears with it. We're talking about a man who's, who's been there and done it you know, and, and been relatively successful at West Ham as well. So we hope that he brings that experience and that, that pace and goals mm. to Everton Football Club. We wish him well. Well, we've spoken to a number of young players on the Everton show when they've put pen to paper on new contracts, and we're about to do so again. Liam Walsh is a popular and very highly thought of member of David Unsworth's under-23 squad, and he's the latest to sign a new deal at Everton. Um, I'm made up since I signed my first one. It's, uh, it's what I've wanted. You know, it's the club that I want to be at and want to play for, and uh, hopefully I can get many more. You've had a taste of the first team in pre-season and a few training sessions as well. How much have you enjoyed that? Yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot. You know, um, with the new coach coming in, um, it's a lot of adjusting, um, a lot of new staff to get used to. Um, new training sessions are good. Um, a lot of the players really like them, like myself. Um, I just want to try and impress and hopefully get my chance one day. It must be a massive confidence piece for someone like Ronald Koeman to put his faith in you with a contract like this as well. Yeah, um, like I said before, it's something that I've always wanted and with a new manager coming in giving me um, the contact straight away. Um, it shows that, that um, you know, he's got a bit of belief in me and um, I want to prove him right and show him what I can do. How much do you have David Unsworth to thank for this contract? Well? Obviously you've worked a lot with him in the under 23s Yeah, a lot. I uh, thank him a lot because, like you said, then I've worked with him a lot. Um, he, he's made me work very hard and that's what you need to get, get new contracts. Um, a lot of other staff as well coming through the academy, they've helped me along my way. But uh, I'm just thankful to all the staff that have been um, helpful to me. You spent time at Yeovil last season. How much has that helped bring you on as a player? Yeah, uh, going out on loan, you know, it's, uh, it's about gaining experience and, and showing, showing clubs what you can do and showing your own club what you can do. And um, I think I went to the right club with the manager. He, he, um, he trusted me to play every week. And um, I was thankful that I got that move and thankful to Everton that they let me out on loan and now I've got to show Everton that, that I can do that here. Looking ahead, you've got three more years at least here. Now what are your targets? Um, hopefully to make me debut soon for Everton and um, just kick on and just be with Everton football team. Well, she's another example of how the loan system can really benefit everybody. He went to Yeovil, a boy, came back a man, got a few games under his belt, scored a couple of goals and... He's just signed a new contract. Yeah, lovely reward for, for Walshie. Um, not only for his performances at under-23 level, but uh, obviously when he went out and learnt an awful lot from playing league football in a mm. difficult situation with Yeovil as well, because yeah. they were down the bottom and you know fighting for points week in, week out. can't have been easy for him because he's a ball-playing midfield player. I mean, he's not, af not afraid to get in and mm. make a tackle, that's for sure. He's got a bit of tenacity about him, Walshie, but uh, his range of passing is excellent and uh, hopefully he can push on now and really make that big next step because it is a tough step to make that jump from under 23 into the first team. That's the big challenge now for him, isn't it? Of course it is, but you know he's ready for it. There's no doubt about that. He's just got to keep his head down, keep working, keep listening and learning from all the coaches around the football club. And uh, if he maintains that desire for the game, then hopefully he'll get his opportunity. I'm sure he will catch the eye of the manager at some point. While Everton under-23s have made a blistering start to their Premier League 2 season, they went into Tuesday night's game at Goodison Park in pole position. However, their opponents, Sunderland, were hot on their heels in second place and a narrow 1-0 win for the Black Cats was enough to knock the Toffees off their perch. It was a rare setback for Dave Unsworth, but it was philosophical after the game. Uh, I thought it was a close game. I thought a point would have been a fair result. Um, we probably edged the chances. Um, didn't take them obviously um, when, when all the opportunities came and I'm standing there thinking well you know it might be one of those nights that you know we don't create and, and, and take our opportunities but we don't lose the game and we actually said that to the players at half time that you know it's going to be a very very tight second half um, make sure we're on the front foot and you know if we get the goal ahead and we know then that they'll have to come at us and, and you know, we might go on and get a second and a third but um, you know, keep it tight at the back and, and don't make silly mistakes. Unfortunately, we've, you know, we've made a stupid mistake, uh, a schoolboy error and it's cost us a game. A pretty dominant first half from ourselves and Callum Dyson went close, hitting the post. Dominic Calvert-Lewin went close as well. Is it just a case of finishing off those chances now in future? Yeah, I thought, I thought we had the better chances throughout the whole game. Um, 
and 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 Callum Dyson has been playing really well at the moment, and, and Dominic, um, you know, they they ran the channels well, they linked up well, and and, and we sh maybe should have been, you know, at half time at least one, if not two up, but. Um, you know, we kept going, created even more chances, but it just wasn't wasn't to be. And and, and what disappoints me more is that we've we've conceded a, a stupid goal when you know we were trying to educate these players into you know obviously winning every game. You know because the group that we've got, I, I expect them to win every game. But if you can't win it, you don't lose it. And um, you know that's a, that's a, a lesson for the place tonight. It must have been nice to give Dominic his his first start in a Everton shirt there. Yeah, I mean I've like when he signed, he um, I've known him since he was 16 and. Uh, I've always known that you know he has the ability to to play at the top level. I thought he was terrific tonight, um, and he'll get better and better. He showed great pace. Um, he looked like a proper number nine, uh, running in behind, holding the ball up, linked well. And um, I thought he did really well on his debut. And uh, you know it's, um, it was a great start from him. Arsenal next up now next week. Are you hoping for to get back on track there, and obviously another win hopefully under our belts. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I've just said to the players at the end of the game, you know, we don't lose very often. And and when and, and John and I are really bad losers, um, so we'll we'll lick our wounds for 24 hours and you know we'll we'll sulk and um, and and then we'll do our our um, homework and we'll we'll look at the game and, and, and feed back to the players and you know and we'll go down to Arsenal and, and you know hopefully you know get back on track and, and that's the only that's the only thing you can do. Graham, you and I were both at the under 23 game on Tuesday night at Goodison. I was making the stadium announcements, you were enjoying yourself in the executive box. <laughs> well, I couldn't help it, I was, I was taking in the game and all of a sudden a piece of pizza arrived at my doorstep. I, I thought it was a good game. It was a good game actually, two sides, I mean David summed it up pretty much there, it was always going to be tight. Mm. Sunderland were really well drilled, they had some, a couple of really good individual players, especially in midfield as well. So it was a really tight game, good game, he's right, we had the better chances, mm. maybe a little bit unfortunate certainly. You know, Callum Dyson cannon in one off, off the post. Kieran Dow had a great free kick in the first after mm. the keeper just about got out. Um, and another chance that only just went wide. So we probably did edge it on chances, but he's right. One silly little mistake mm. and it cost us. It'll do the boys no harm that will it to understand that small margins matter and one mistake and bingo, the game's gone. It's all about your concentration levels. I mean, you can dominate a game of football, but if it's nil-nil, you know, you shut off for one second at the back there. And all of a sudden, you know, the ball's in the back of your net and it's an uphill task. So, yeah, but that's what it's all about. It's all about lessons learning. You know, sometimes it doesn't do you any harm. You know, you, you, obviously we want to win games of football, but every so often a little uh, reality check doesn't do you any harm. Very quickly, Dominic Calvert-Lewin looked well on his debut. He did. I wouldn't mind half a yard of his pace, I tell you. He <laughs> looks, you know, very, very quick. And as he says, if you work the channels and get him down those channels, he can cause defenders an awful lot of problems. So definitely someone look, to look out for for the future. Yet another one for the future at Everton. And that nicely rounds off the second section of this week's Everton show. Part three is our big interview slot and this week it's with Kevin Ratcliffe who spoke to us while we conducted a Goodison Park Stadium tour for him and his family. Welcome back. Now, Kevin Ratcliffe is undoubtedly the most successful captain in Everton's history, and let's be honest, he's likely to remain so for a few more years yet. Two league titles, a European Cup Winners' Cup and an FA Cup is some target for current and future captains to aim for. When he called me a couple of weeks ago to ask if I'd show his family around the stadium, I was, of course, more than happy to oblige. So we rocked up to the ground with his dad, his son and his two daughters, and the memories came flooding back. So this is more or less where you used to sit, isn't it? Yeah, it's just here, ironically. <laughs> Did everybody uh, sit in the same place every week? It was 1 to 11, wasn't it then? <laughs> so it was easy enough uh, to sort of know where you were and then obviously the subs were down the bottom end. But uh, yeah, Gorn and Nev, Gary Bales, myself, Derek or Waggy, Sharpie. Sharpie tells me that when you were in here, you, you got a feel of how big the attendance was because you could hear the crowd. Yeah, yeah, you could. Because obviously the genuines were different, so uh, it was a little bit more. There was more windows in there, I think, on the top, you know, mm. um, so you could you could actually hear them um, before and after the match. And I see the little escape hatches still there. If you lost, <laughs> you can get out a little bit quicker. We needed that in the early yeah, days, yeah, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, it certainly did. Yeah. What was it like sitting in here? 
at half time in the Bayern Munich game. You know, just waiting for your instructions off your manager, really. And you know, his famous saying is that uh, keep putting the ball in the in the box, and you know, the crowd will suck it in. He did say that. We had this winning men mentality anyway, didn't we? That we knew that we could beat anybody on our day, and uh, I think what we couldn't believe is that we were one nil down. But I think second half we just went out there, and I think everybody just. You know, although we were given 100%, I think we just rolled our sleeves up and gave another 100%, and that was too much for the Germans in the end. It must have been terrific to walk into this dressing room knowing that you were going to win the game. Well, it's not just that game. I think it was many a game you know, that you're going into. I remember going into one game, and I think in the first six minutes, I think we're playing against Notts County, and John Chidozzi scores. And uh, you, know, you just look around and say, how's that happened? And you, but you just know that you're going to win it. Um, it's just by how many. Of course, in your day, there was no going out to warm up. 45 minutes before the game, was there? You just uh, yeah. Well, there was. Yeah, there was a warm up. It was entirely up to you, yourself. And me, for one, I never used to warm up. My warm up was uh, a hot bath, right. a few stretches in the in the changing room. Um, it was only later on in my career, when I was getting older, that I felt that I needed to warm up a little bit better. Yeah. What was it like walking down the tunnel as the captain? Was there any banter with the? With the opposition, did you have to get into them all? You didn't walk out together, you never shook their hands. The Wimbledons of the world, for example. Well, you wouldn't want to shake their hands, would you? <laughs> uh, you'd, you'd most probably have it bitten off or something <laughs> if you did. But uh, Tell us no. about what happened with the, uh, the ghetto blaster that they brought. Oh, I think Nev, yeah, it, it was on then. I think Nev booted it. Um, <laughs> and we beat him and uh, I think he just booted it as he walked past. It was on top of a bin. But that wasn't until later on. You know, he wasn't like that earlier on in the in the early 80s when he first got on, but uh, it well, was... Well, he had to go out on loan for a bit, didn't he? Howard sent him out on loan to Port Vale. Um, about two months later, maybe, come back. I'm not too sure how long he was away. He'd come back and he... It was a different Neville. And, and maybe that personality needed to be brought out of him and it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Because, I mean, he was just one hell of a goalkeeper. I love playing with him. You know, he, he was just top, top Never draw. Never him, surely. No way, no way, no way. I, I, you know, I, I fought really hard not to even take him down. To, I, I begged him to get a, a driving license so that he could travel on his own down for the Welsh Games. But uh, I used to take him. But we used to have some fun, me and Nev. I, you know, I, I love the guy. I mean, we, we, you know, I always used to question him before and after games and half time. You know, maybe could you have come for that? You know, I'd always put something in his head that could he come for it. Um, but uh, Nev was Nev. Um, you know, he'd say things to me. But we, we, we never took it to heart. We always sort of, you know, learnt from it or try and better ourselves from whatever each other was saying to each other. There's very much a feeling amongst the punters, Kev, that we'd already won that tournament by beating Bayern Munich. Do yeah. you feel the same? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, the hardest part of the the job was getting to the final. Once you're at the final, it's not a formality, but uh, it's one of them that we should win it. And I think the mentality of the, the lads, and it just seems to be one of them that whatever the opposition could do, we could just up our game and, and go again. What's that all about? Well, it looked quite good on the day. <laughs> and when being Welsh, you can get away with that. Yes, yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody has a clue where it is. Really? I haven't got, no, I don't think anybody has a clue where that has ended up, and I don't even think Nev. Um, so he's most probably cleaning his windows with it the next day, <laughs> wasn't he? But it's, it's one of them mysteries of the game, really. This was one when you've come to the football club as an apprentice that you want to be on this wall. Right. Yeah. That was your, your aim, get yeah. on this wall. Unfortunately, fortunately for me, I've been on it for maybe a decade. A few, black, to, a few black and white ones. A few black you? and white. No, no, there's no black and white ones <laughs> of me, mate. We did have colour then and electricity. <laughs> but uh, no, you look at it and you, you're going back to you know Dixie Dean and that and T.G. Jones and people like that. You're going back, seeing that you know further down the line you're on it. Mm. And, uh, I, I think it was a great honour. It must have been terrific for your dad to see his lad lead the team out. Yeah, I mean himself and his uh, his three brothers used to come. They had season tickets from about sixty. 66, 67 onwards. Did he go to Wembley and all the yeah, big games? Yeah, he went to all the big games. He wasn't going to miss them with the rest of the family. So uh, I think that was a story one year that uh, we got to our first Wembley appearance and he, he booked a 52-seater to go. And I turned around to him and said, have they all got sick, it's dad. And he says, uh, no, you'll be able to get them, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> one of the more bizarre duties for a captain in those days, you're telling me, Kev, was uh, sort of the, 
Players' lounge tickets for the boys? Well, it's a big thing in the players' lounge, you know. Um, the families and friends and everything, and I had this little stamp and the, the, the tickets, and I, I used to, uh, after sort of every Friday night, do about, I think anything, about 90, something like that. <laughs> so you can imagine then I'm, so I'm you doing them. actually physically stamp them? Uh, stamp them and then put them in envelopes. It's just one big ball, like, to be fair. <laughs> Did the opposition players used to come in? Yeah, the yeah, they, they could come in, and uh, depending if we got tickets at their ground for the lounge, then they got tickets. But if they didn't give us tickets, they didn't get tickets. There was no afters, though, was there, in there? No, no, no. It was, uh, it was a friendly lounge, and uh, we did have to pay for a, a, out of our own money, by the way. This was the lads. <laughs> we used to have a, a pound a week for the lads to actually put a doorman on. That doorman was Dave Ash who was the janitor at the football club for many a year, especially when I was there anyway. But nothing got past him, did it? it nothing got past him. He would have made a really good centre-half or goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> that side of the game's changed and probably will never come back, Kev. Opposition teams having a beer after the game. Yeah, it seems to be that, you, you know, they'll get on and they'll, you know, have whatever, energy drinks or water or, or whatever. And then a, even a pizza now, I think they have, don't they? I'm not too sure what they, what the... Uh, regime is. I mean, I remember, you know, dietary requirements in our day were, you know, what, 12 o'clock, you'd, you'd see people having steaks or Dover sole. <laughs> it actually stopped under Howard. He just turned to me and said, what do you have for pre-match? I've, I've noticed you don't have steak. And I said, oh, look, I just have uh, beans and poached egg on toast. Uh, if you're having that, so can everybody else. Yeah. And I don't think that was dietary. I think that was more how much it was costing. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure to show you and your family around Goodison Park, Kev, and uh, thanks for taking time off to speak to us. Oh, cheers, it's been, uh, thanks very much, because uh, I think it's like I say, my dad hasn't seen this since I played, and obviously the kids haven't, I think the eldest has been on the tour, but it's been, uh, it's been good for them as well. Thank you. I enjoyed that there, speaking to rats inside the dressing room, getting a little bit of insight because the home dressing room hasn't really changed that much, has it, even since your day? No, not at all. No, it's pretty much the same, isn't it? Uh, standard fare at Goodison Park. Um, been some sensational players in there over the years, and he was one of them, Kev. You'd played for Chelsea's first team, so you were, you were used to the top flight of English football, but was it a little bit daunting walking into the Everton dressing room? for the first time with all the characters that were about? Well, of course it is. I mean, you know, Kevin mentioned Neville there. I mean, Neville... <laughs> I mean, if anybody's ever met Nev, you'd, you'd, it's, it's an experience you never forget. I mean, let alone spending an awful lot of time with a man. But, uh, no, he was, out, first and foremost, an outstanding goalkeeper. But uh, not the most subtle man I've ever met in my life, put it that way. He said it as it, uh, said it, as it is. If you could survive Neville, you could survive anything. Well, exactly. I mean, your shirt in that interview, Daz, that wouldn't have survived, <laughs> I'll tell you that for certain. <laughs> He'd have had me on toast, wouldn't he? Who, who were your pals in the dressing room in the early days? Um, I have to say Peter Beagree's family were magnificent mm -hmm. to me uh, really? when I first came up. They really took me under their wing and, and showed me about. I, I went over to, you know, Southport kind of area and uh, pretty much settled down there. Gary Ablett was brilliant with me as well, God bless him. He was brilliant going out, because mm. I, I was in the hotel in the centre of Liverpool for the first four months of my career up at, up at Goodison, and Gary would meet me after training, and we'd go and have a game of um, snooker with John mm. Parrott, who was yeah. obviously a good mate of, of Gary's at the time as well. So he, he was different class, Gary. Some people listen to that and they say, living in a hotel for four months, having everything done for you, can't be that bad, but it must be difficult. It is Eventually. Difficult. Yeah, I mean, it is because, you know, as you say, I mean, how many times can you go through the menu? <laughs> you know, how many, um, you know, do you want to keep staring at the same walls? Mm. You know, that sort of thing. And it's just normality, you know, getting up and making yourself a cup of tea and, and watching the telly or, I don't know, silly little things like that. I mean, obviously, I know there's tellies in hotel rooms, but, you, you know, you're laid on a bed. It's totally different, but it's, you, you just feel a whole lot more comfortable. And it was no, no change for me. You know, no significance, but the fact that my form at Everton Football Club totally and utterly uh, transformed itself once I'd moved house and once I felt really settled in the area. Was Peter Beagree the type of guy who you thought would go into the media and, and craft a career for himself on television as he has done? 100% because he was never short of something to say, Beags, <laughs> I tell you that. Um, no, he was excellent because he's articulate, Beags, mm. and he knows his football, he loves his football, which is important as well. And... You know, he's carved out a nice little opportunity for himself down at Sky with the championship. Doing well, isn't he? You know, doing really, really well. He comes across very well. He knows that, he knows that level inside mm. out as mm. well. 
and I know for a fact he does an awful lot of homework on it as well, mm. so he takes his job really seriously. You can tell that because he comes across really well. He does, he does, he comes across well. As I say, it's, it helps mm. if you can talk well. And believe you me, if there's one thing Peter Beagree was good at, <laughs> it was talking. <laughs> he can talk. And that's us done for part three. Coming up in the fourth and final segment of this week's programme, we pay tribute to the man who was on the cusp of 600 Premier League appearances. And of course, we look ahead to our next Premier League challenge against Middlesbrough on Saturday. Welcome back. Now here's a fact I've given you before, but I still find it utterly amazing. On the day that Gareth Barry played his first ever Premier League game for Aston Villa, the manager of Everton at the time was Howard Kendall. It was April 1998, the great man was in his third spell as manager at Goodison, and a floppy fringed 17 year old came on as a substitute for John Gregory's Aston Villa against Sheffield Wednesday. Gareth Barry has certainly been around for a long time. Well, Gareth is highly likely to start for Everton against Middlesbrough on Saturday, and if he does, it will be his 600th Premier League appearance. Only Ryan Giggs and Frank Lampard stand ahead of him now. Lifelong Evertonian and world champion boxer Tony Bellew is a big, big fan of the Blues midfielder. The experience, the professionalism that he brings to the club is brilliant. Uh, he's a role model professional, Darren, so you know what he's brought to Everton since coming here has just been magnificent. It really, really has. He, he's just... He's brought a solidarity and, and, you know, just so many different things to the club. And like I say, for, for young professionals coming up, and we have a lot of youth players coming through the ranks now, and they've got just the most absolute perfect professional they could ever wish to imagine in Gareth Barry, you know, 600 Premier League games. You'll be very lucky if you see another one in, in a decade do that, you know. So it's, uh, it's unheard of to play so many games. Week in, week out, he's fit, and uh, at his age, and I'm, you know, I'm sure he's going to say it. But <laughs> to be fit, week in, week out, you know, you've got players who are uh, crying off every week at other clubs, you know, scared to, to to put a toe out of place. And this fella's playing every single week in, week out, and it's amazing. It's it's a really, really fantastic person to have at the club. 600 Premier League games. That's something like 30 league games a season for 20 seasons. It's an incredible level of fitness, but also to play that long at this level, you need to be a right good footballer as well. And he's still got a Tony, hasn't he? He has. You know, you see, Gareth's always looking to play forward, not sideways. It'd be very easy for a player of his of his style and his standard and stature to play back, always to come back and look for the safe option. But he doesn't. He gets hold of the ball, and the first thing he does is look up and he looks for a pass going forward. And it, you know, it it helps the defence so much. The, his fellow midfielders takes the pressure off them. He's like I say, he's just an outstanding player. To, to have the career he's had is exceptional. I just love him to be lifting a trophy with us. Graham, as I said to Tony Bellew there at Goodison Park, 600 Premier League appearances equates to roughly 30 a season for 20 seasons. That's not including your cup games. It's an incredible level of consistency. Well, it is. It's testament to his fitness levels. You know, his desire as well. I mean, mm. people forget, you know, you've got to have a massive amount of desire to want to be playing 30, 40 games a season. And, you know, he's, a, he's an outstanding character. I've had the pleasure of uh, about four hours of golf mm. with him a couple of weeks. And it was really interesting. We had a good chat and a, it was a, like quite good to have an insight into his thinking about football. You know, we talked about his fitness levels as well and, and the requirements, the fact that he's getting on a little bit in age. But, you know, the... You've got to keep playing. It's better. Mm. The older you get, the easier it is if you keep playing. It's when you stop that the problems come about because you, you know, you, you're trying to get back up to speed again. So Gareth works hard in training. He looks after himself off the pitch to make sure that he can continue to play at the highest level week in, week out. He's such a clever footballer, isn't he? He knows exactly instinctively where he's going to put it and when he's going to put it there. Yeah, I mean, he's always got a picture in his mind. All the top players you know, see the picture before the ball even comes to them. And he knows exactly what he wants to do with it. He's unselfish in his work rate for the side as well. as He'll put his neck above the parapet and put himself in difficult situations to help other people. Still plenty more to come as well, I'm sure, from Gareth Barry. Well, from the moment that he first walked through the door at Finch Farm at the end of the summer transfer window in 2013, Gareth's been first class on and off the pitch. Seamus Coleman confirmed as much when we spoke to him this week. 
he's a top professional and I think if you ask any of the lads in the squad they've got massive respect for Gareth Barry um, he he uh, he just commands respect from his from his professionals and his performances week in week out or or something else and they have been since he signed here um, he's always wanting to get on the ball and and you can see really why why he's been at the top for so long and what a, what an achievement for him and and we're lucky that he's doing it for for us because uh, we're very lucky to have him does it put it into perspective with the fact that you was only nine years old when he, he made his Aston Villa debut and Tom Davis, a player he played alongside in central midfield for the last few minutes against Sunderland, wasn't even born? Yeah, he's, 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 been, he's been going such a long time and he's been a top player for all them years as well, which says a lot about him. And As I said, he's a, he's a really nice lad around the place and all the lads respect him massively and, and we're so lucky to have him at the club. And, He's great for, I suppose, the likes of Tom Davis. If, if you want someone to look up to, you, d you don't need to look any further than, than Gareth Barry, someone who's been doing it at the very top for so long and, and he will continue to do so for another few years, I've no doubt about that. Yannick Balassi, I remember reading an interview with you last year who said he was one of the toughest opponents to face in the Premier League, one of the toughest opponents you'd come up against. How does it feel now to have him on your side? Is it, is it relief more than Yeah, anything? massive relief, yeah. Um, uh, first and foremost, Yannick is a he's a great lad, and, and we're uh, once again we're lucky to have him. And I know what it, what he's like for opposition fullbacks. You don't you don't relish playing against him because he is he is a, a very good winger who who's very direct, and likes to get at the fullback. And we have seen that Monday night against Sunderland, how how good he was off the left. And um, it'll be great for me as well to have him around the training ground to train against him and. And as I said, if he was my toughest opponent last year and I can and I can do well against him in training, it'll make it easier for me against other wingers. So it's good to have him around the place and uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have him as well because he is a top winger and, and he's done really well in the Premier League. And as I said, Monday night he was, he was brilliant and set up two great goals, or set up one goal and another great chance for Ron. All being well, Graham. Game number 600 in the Premier League for Gareth will be Middlesbrough at Goodison on Saturday. What are you expecting from Middlesbrough? Um... It's difficult to say, isn't it? Because mm. we're, you know, unknown quantity to a degree. I mean, they'll they'll be well organised. They'll work their socks off for certain. I think they're a lot better than people pr probably think they are. Mm. Um, but hang on a minute, they're coming to Goodison Park. We're on the crest of a wave. The atmosphere is going to be electric. I'm sure about that as well. So, you know, we've got to hit them hard early on. You know, don't give them any chance to get into any kind of rhythm, and make sure they know what Premier League football is all about. Coming to Goodison Park and make sure the atmosphere is as, uh, as loud as it possibly can be. They've made a solid start, middle, but that's for sure. It'll be a good game. Right, let's leave the last word this week to the boss, the man who has orchestrated the terrific start to this season. We've said before on this show, haven't we, and we'll doubtless say it again, that Ronald Koeman is not an easy man to please. He sets himself and his players the very highest of standards. He won't settle for second best, that's for sure. And that's why he's taking absolutely nothing for granted when Middlesbrough come to Goodison at the weekend. The most important is always uh, the coming one, the first one. What happened uh, after the, the first, we will see. Uh, it's uh, till uh, Saturday evening and Sunday morning we have training and then we will prepare the Norwich game. But, but I'm not the person who is looking forward. Uh, why? It's life, everything can happen in football, everything, everything can happen in life. Uh, the most important is the, the coming up game and that's this Saturday against Middlesbrough. Mohamed Bezic is injured, McCarthy, Gibson also out, but have you got a full squad to choose from other than that? Yes, we have the, the same number players available for the weekend. This, that means that um, we have to take and to make decisions about that, but we don't have any more injury uh, after Monday. Enne Valencia has joined up with the squad this week. How impressed have you been with him and how's he settling in so far? Yeah, he's, he's, he's working hard. He's uh, trying to give uh, the best competition to the rest of the players and, and he's trying to, to get a place in the team and uh, um, a place in, uh, in the A team. And that decision uh, we need to make tomorrow. After Middlesbrough Grain, we play Norwich City in the uh, League Cup. Looking forward to that one? I am. I mean, obviously, let's get the first bit of business done first, and hopefully that'll be three points at Goodison Saturday. Um, but no, then we turn our attentions to the Cup again. And we showed last year that if you can get your head down for the first two or three rounds of that competition, 
very quickly you find yourself in a quarter final and then it gets very exciting. So a great opportunity again, another home tie against the Norwich side that have started the championship campaign mm. very well. So we have to tr treat them with the greatest amount of respect. But again, we, with it being at Goodison Park, we'd expect to progress. The form that we're in, and given that we are the Premier League side at home, the spectators will justifiably be fully expecting a home win. Yeah, and I mean, uh, again, it all depends on, on what side the coach puts out as well, because, mm. you know, in the last round, maintained a pretty s a strong side. Mm. I think that was probably to do with fitness levels as well and making sure everybody was up to speed as quickly as possible. It will be very, very interesting, bar any unfortunate injury Saturday, what side Ronald puts out. But we've regularly got full internationals on the bench anyway, haven't we? Well, great opportunity. Again, if people do get the opportunity to play, if they're on the fringe, and the opportunity to show the manager that they deserve a place in the first 11. That'll be another good night at Goodison Park. But first of all, it's Everton versus Middlesbrough on Saturday evening. Or is it late afternoon? It's a half-five kick-off anyway, and it's one we're all looking forward to. There are many, many reasons to be cheerful right now if you're a blue. Things are going really well at Goodison Park. Long may it continue. My thanks to the Diamond for his input this week, and of course to all of you for watching. We'll be back next week with another Everton show.